I'm Chris Walker. I'm Eric's friend, and uh, um, and it's really a pleasure to be here. And actually, it's uh, wonderful seeking the Lord and working on the message that He wanted to give me because I've gotten a lot out of it, and I I hope you will. Um, let's just say a short prayer and then uh, begin. Father, we thank you that you fill your word and that you inhabit your word. We invite you right here into this service. Speak to us, touch our hearts, draw us to yourself, show us things we've never seen. And uh, we thank you for your great love for us. Amen. Um, I'm from uh, Farmington, Unionville. I have three kids. Two in college, one is a junior in high school. And just so you know a little bit about me, I'm uh, in the middle of teaching my youngest daughter how to drive. And uh, we are in the middle of trying to actually get 40 hours of driving on the road. And I just want to tell you, two weeks ago we started, and I made sure to go to the town hall, which no one was there after five, and uh, and... The, the thought is that we would just drive around the town hall, you know, and not go anywhere. And so she finally got in. She's very petite, and uh, she had to pull the seat all the way up to the console so her feet actually touched the console uh, in order to reach the, ba- the brake. And she looked at me, and she looked fairly fearful, and she said, Dad, my friend is the brake. <laughs> and I said, that's great, sweetie. And... Uh, so she kept her foot on that brake for 20 minutes. I wasn't quite sure what to do. You know, if you get mad, you don't want trauma to set in, you know. And uh, you want to, you know, encourage them for each little step. And I'll tell you, um, I'm hopefully going to end this story for you. So it has something to do with the message. But this is the way I got out of it. I said, sweetie, you know what will happen? If you take your foot off that brake, there's enough energy in the gear, if you put it in gear, that it'll actually just creep along without even touching the accelerator. She said, okay. And uh, so we waited, you know, for maybe seven minutes for that to soak into her head. And, uh, and then she tried it. And we did. You know, what you can do when you go with whatever is in that engine you can only kind of slowly poke a lawn, and then if you get to a downhill, you can glide, but no way can you go up anything or if there's any obstacle in the way. You've got to use the accelerator. Okay, we're going to start. The title of the message is Awakened by the Heart of Jesus. And I've been reading a book uh, called Gentle and Lowly by Ortland, and it's about what Jesus' heart really is. And I have been startled by it because, you know, we sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, and we tell each other, well, remember, Jesus loves you. But what does that really mean? What's the depth of that? What does it mean that Jesus loves us? I think we have some misperceptions of it. But I want to tell you another issue that is on my heart that draws me to talking about the heart of Jesus. And that is that I went to two family events just recently, and I was at a funeral of a cousin of mine, and we were singing Amazing Grace. 500 people in the room, and it was a great place to to turn our hearts to God. And it went like this, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a soul like me. My brothers and I all looked at each other. A soul? Wait a minute, I thought it was a wretch. I thought that we were sinners. What happened? Don't we need Jesus anymore? Then, I was at another gathering, a baptism for a little uh, daughter of a niece of mine, and it was in New York City at a nice church and really liked the preacher and it was filled with all young professionals, doctors and Juilliard teachers and, and people in the uh, entertainment industry, all Christians. 
And the pastor got to a point where he was going to talk about sin. And he said, I'm not going to use the word sin. He said, because there's so much misunderstanding about it. And people immediately think you're trying to judge them. And, and they feel condemned about it. So I'm going to use the Greek word, sarx. That's what's written in Greek for the flesh, the sin nature. And I thought, wow, where are we going? This is really... This is, this is not good. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And if no one's a sinner, even Christians, guys, I don't know how you are, but I know I'm a sinner. I might be a saint positionally, but I'm still a sinner. I can tell by my mind. I can tell by my thoughts. I can tell by some of the words that come out of my mouth. I can tell by some of my actions and I can also tell by how my actions have affected either other people or myself. So two years ago, I was in a meeting of pastors and there erupted a very hot discussion on whether we should use the word repentance in our services. And the one pastor was saying, it just brings people so much guilt and they are just so uncomfortable when we talk about sin and repentance. And I'm saying, oh, where are we coming to? Thankfully, the, the greatest percentage of the pastors in that room were shocked and horrified. But that it actually got to the point of a, not a discussion and then an argument, it was shocking to me. All right, so this is what I want to talk about. We're going to talk about just facing up to our sin nature and understanding one simple thing. Our sin nature entitles us to the deepest affection and joyous response of Jesus to us daily. And if you let go that you're still a sinner, you're actually closing the door on Jesus. Okay, we're going to cover his heart and then how we actually can apply and access that heart response to us. And then I'll close with some final choices. Um, our sin. The first mention of sin in the Bible is when God speaks to Cain and he tells him that sin is crouching at the door. It's lying at the door. So what's the picture? It's the picture of a beast, a wild beast. Something is lurking and crouched. And if you let him in, he will control you. Okay, so there is our first kind of meeting with sin. And, hey, that's pretty true. Temptation and our inability to effectively respond to sin is an enemy to our soul. Because we're sinners and we're prone to respond to sin. Okay, so uh, the second uh, issue that came on the scene is God's whole plan of revealing the sinfulness of man by giving the Ten Commandments and all the commandments in the law. And so we had a long period of time where man was hopefully convinced that he needed help and he needed God. Jesus came along, and when Jesus came, he actually helped us understand that it's not just outward actions, adultery and killing others, but actually it's the thoughts and motives of the heart that lead to that. Wait a minute now. Sin is getting really big here. Sin starts in the mind, in the heart. It's conceived in these thoughts that we either allow to keep growing or not. It comes out in words. You know what Jesus redefined when he talked about uh, killing? He said, even if you call your brother or sister stupid, raka, you're liable to hell. Wow. Lord, help me with my words. How many times have you said that about yourself? Oh, I'm stupid. Is there judgment on that? That's what Jesus said. 
I think we need help. So Jesus made it clear that sin is not just the actions, but it is the very thoughts and motives that lead up to it, the actions themselves, and then it's also the consequence. Sin is also what it caused. What happened to you because someone rejected, told on you, lied, betrayed you? What happened when a a loved one dies and you mourn and there's pain? All of the effects of sin linger in the consequences, right? So we've got a big spectrum of sin. The scripture says that he who knew no sin became sin for us. Do you know what was laid on Christ? It wasn't just all the actions. It was all of the thoughts that led to it and all of the consequences too. Do you think there's anything in our own experience that wasn't laid on Christ? I want to ask you, do you think any of your really good deeds had any little stain of sin in it? Listen, I know for myself that if I do something really good, I might remind myself and cover myself that, oh, that went really well. And I have some pride or self-interest in it. That's sin. That's the tinge of self-centered life that only lives for itself, affecting even my good things. So here's my point. Every experience of the human life was put on Christ. He knows you and me and every person who's been created on this earth intimately. He knows exactly what you've gone through, what you thought, what you felt, what it did to you, and how it got you wherever you are now. And he wants in on it. He wants to save you. He wants to give you freedom. He wants to give you peace. Listen, this is not over. You can't say, well, that's just the way I am. Oh, I'm going to have to live with those problems forever. No, Jesus loves us that much that he wants to transform every part of us. He's that big. You see, he didn't come for the righteous. They don't need a physician. He came for the sick. They need a physician. And we're all sick. Are you woman or man enough to say, I'm a sinner? Otherwise, you don't need Christ. You know what? We would be much better evangelists and witnesses if, if we kept hold of the fact that we're sinners who are actually humbled and God gets our attention to change things in our lives. The people who we're trying to reach wouldn't think that we're holier than thou. They wouldn't think that we're better than them. They, we would just simply say, hey, I'm a sinner too. I have just as much sin as you do. You know, you have 10,000 thoughts in a day. How many of those thoughts are you aware of? (laughs) They happen so fast. We've got an incredible mind. But we're so judgmental. I'll, I'll claim it. I am so judgmental. I'll drive down the street and I have judged a few people and summed them up on the way. And I say to myself, am I, do I have any compassion? Where's the compassion of Christ? Why do I simply say, well, they're very different than me and that's who they are, that's the way they are, that's because of that. What did Jesus say? When he was talking to Nicodemus, he said, God did not send me into this world to judge it, but to save it. Do you think we can at all stand behind him and try to save this world if we have judgment in our heart? We can't. You can't be a good witness if you judge. Judge not lest you be judged. What did he tell us? There's a big 
log in your eye. I have it. So let's just look at a, a verse that um, is really, uh, it capsulizes this picture of sin in 1 Timothy. And uh, Paul makes this amazing statement. He says, you know, I was formerly a blasphemer. This is 1 Timothy 1, 13. And a persecutor and a violent aggressor. And yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly and in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Jesus Christ. 15. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am the chief and foremost sinner. You know, he could easily have said, and who I was the chief and foremost sinner because of all those things I did. But no, he said, I am the chief and and foremost sinner. That's because as a sinner, Jesus' heart is completely open to you. As soon as we think of ourselves as doing well and don't need too much help and I'm fine, it's like that Laodicean church that said, oh, we're wealthy, we don't have need of anything, we're fine. Jesus said, you don't know how wretched and poor, blind, naked you are. You don't even think of that as, as Christians, Jesus said to them. So, one other thought before we leave and go to his heart. How does he respond to us as sinners? And uh, did you know that social scientists have found something incredible? Social scientists have done all these experiments in all the different cultures of the world and they found that there's something called cognitive bias. That is, that there is, all through all cultures, this particular way of thinking that is totally ab absorbed with ourselves. That every culture has this thing, this mental direction that is always thinking about self. Cognitive bias. I think we call that sin. Let's look at Jesus. What's his heart in response? One of the things that uh, uh, I did in order to really see what Jesus' heart was towards us is to look at how the high priest responds to sinners in Hebrews. And I just want to read for you uh, four verses that actually illustrate Jesus' response to sinners. And I think you will want to say that you're a sinner and actually perhaps begin to think of yourself more humbly, more as a needy person that depends on Jesus more regularly. Number one, Hebrews 12, 2. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despised the shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. For the joy set before him. Remember, he's looking at all of the suffering and the cross and all of the cruelty and all the separation from his father and all the demonic oppression put upon him and all the diseases and all the effects of sin, everything put. And he just looked right through all that and he said, for the joy set before me. So what was he looking at? Jesus has overwhelming joy to share his overcoming power of sin with us and to impart the glory of his character to us. He is overjoyed. Don't think of him as someone who just is waiting for you and he's mad at you because you sinned again. No, he already knows that sin. He knows what it's going to do to you and he can't wait that you just come and say, would you help me with this? Would you transform that dead part of me that just keeps releasing death to other people? Can you bring life to that? Do you believe that Jesus is that interested in every aspect of our sin? Yes. yes. If you would let him in. 
I think part of our problem is that we've judged God. Like most authorities, we think that they will scoff at us and hold us at a distance and say, you better try again. No, that's not God's heart. He's overjoyed to be involved in your transformation, your forgiveness, and the change in your life. Jesus is ready for you. Number two, Hebrews 7.25. He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him because he always lives to make intercession for them. Look at that. He saves to the uttermost. So there isn't anything so deep, anything that you want to hide and keep hidden. There isn't something so shameful and that you're ashamed of that Jesus doesn't already know and he has his eye on it. He says, I want to help them right there. I want to come in. So we can't have this mindset if we're real Christians that that's just the way I am or that's just what my past has made me and that's just what other people think I should be. None of this. Listen, you're born again. The Spirit of God is working in you. Jesus Christ is waiting for you to say, help me. And what would it be like if you became more like Christ? I mean, just come on. Think about it. What would the life be like in your family, with, at work, with your wife, with your children? He's waiting. You know, this could be really exciting. If you get a glimpse and let Jesus in, stop holding him back and let him in, he could really transform you. So Jesus is committed to a full and complete rescue and he intercedes until it's done just to prove it. Remember what that verse said? Because he always lives to make intercession for them. You know, he's not stopping to have a banquet. The banquet is when we all get there, right? He's not doing other things like we do. We go and enjoy ourselves and do other things. It says, he ever liveth to intercede. That means all his time now is praying for us. Why? Because in order for this transformation process that is God's plan, that we actually are going to be in the image of Christ, hopefully you're not going to just wait until you meet him to have that happen. Hopefully you will enter into the joy that he gets and that you will have when each part of you starts to change. And he's praying for it to happen. The reason why he hasn't gotten off of his prayer place and is still interceding is because we aren't fully involved with what he wants done with his death and resurrection, that power in our lives. Uh, Hebrews 5.2, the high priest is able to deal gently with the ignorant and the misguided or wayward since he himself is also beset with weakness. Can you imagine this? Jesus took on all of our weakness. Don't be ashamed of any part of, of you. He already knows it and loves you. With our wives, there's certain things I don't want a wife to know. If I had a thought that really, oh man, that was a really bad one. Um, I, I, she might not trust me or my closest friends, I don't share everything with them. I'm too embarrassed by my sin, too embarrassed by some of my thoughts, too embarrassed by my judgmentalness. But listen, Jesus knows it all. And he's madly in love with us because he would love to see what he has done on our sakes, that changing power, that resurrection life, if the same spirit that dwelled in him dwells in us, then there can be a release of supernatural life into any dead part of you. By dead, I mean this. It releases death. It's that dead mortal body. Okay, here is my uh, summary statement with that verse. Total solidarity with us. That's what Jesus is. He's totally with us, totally identified 
Why keep them away? Why keep them? Let them in. Tell them what your real problems are. He is drawn to our weakness and is connected in every, to every human being on every level of experience that we have. Last one, Hebrews 4.15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one which has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Here's my summary point here. Jesus has an awareness from his own experience of our temptation and sin and its consequences that we will never have. C.S. Lewis tells a really interesting picture about this fact that Jesus knew all of our temptation but never sinned. He tells it like this. Temptation is like a wind contrary to you. And it's coming to, to seduce you with a thought to do something that you desire. What the heart desires, the will chooses, and the mind defends. So here comes... The wind. Now, I don't know about you, but if the temptation is aimed right at my weakness, I'll probably fall right on the ground after the first breath of air that comes by, let alone when it picks up. I've been on the top of Mount Washington in the winter with a 60 mile an hour wind, 60, 70 mile an hour wind, and we had to have crampons. And I'll tell you, you couldn't stand straight. You'd be over on. You actually had to lean in like that and walk to get out. So when C.S. Lewis says, Jesus faced the full effect of temptation and he didn't sin, he didn't fall down. We give up at the first breath of air. He took on the full effect of every temptation. Can you just say, what, what, that, that's incredible. That means he can help you overcome if you just call out. Yes. He knows exactly how to stand against that force because he took it all on. Amen. There's no human being who took on temptation all the way when it threw everything it could at you. So now, hopefully, we understand when Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because Jesus took on all that judgment, all of that condemnation, and instead, he's left knowing our experience of sin, what we're experiencing right now, and he wants to help us. So if there's any door you could open, anyone you could speak to, it's Jesus about whatever plagues your heart. Okay, so how do we access this? Um, you know, I, I love uh, the, uh, the picture in Revelation, and I'll just quickly talk about it. You know that section of the Laodiceans where uh, they close the door, and Jesus says, it's like you close the door, and I'm knocking, and I'm calling to you. If, if you hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in and sup with you. But Jesus is patiently waiting outside because they think they're fine. Uh, they don't know that they're sinners. And what I love about as soon as that letter is over, chapter four begins and it says, John says, and behold, there was a door open in heaven and I heard a voice. And it was that voice of Jesus saying, come up here and I'll show you things. Do you see the juxtaposition? When it comes to God, his door is open. When it comes to God, his voice is clear and calling your name and he wants you. And he's ready. He's just inviting you in. Us, we're the ones with the closed door. We're the ones he's waiting on if we would hear his voice. But his voice is ready to call to you. Okay, so how do we actually apply and, and receive the power of this love for us? And it, it really is by the Spirit. And so I'm going to outline how the Spirit works in order for you to access this. Listen, you have the Holy Spirit. You can ask him to help you receive the love of Jesus for any sin you struggle with, any character trait that bothers you, anything 
Jesus is so overjoyed, you'll feel the joy start coming on you when you ask him in. Here it goes. Number one, John 16, 8. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit, when he comes, will convict the world of sin. So the Holy Spirit's the one who convicts us of sin. It is the one thing the Holy Spirit wants to do. It's the first thing he wants to do. We would like him, oh, Lord, uh, Holy Spirit, just fill me with joy. Oh, Holy Spirit, just give me a sense of your presence. Oh, Holy Spirit. You know what he's saying? Can I help you understand your sin? Here, I'll give you a thought. What would happen if we said yes to what the Holy Spirit wants to do first? Guess how powerful those other things might come. How much he might want to grace us with amazing healings, amazing work of the Spirit. But the first agenda of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of sin. Why? Because that allows Jesus to work in us. If we did that, Jesus would work through us. But we need to let him work in us. Okay, so <clears throat> second one, Romans 12, 1 through 2. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice so that he can transform them. Did you ever wonder why it said in Romans 1 that this is our spiritual service of worship? This is how we really worship God. This is the real spiritual deal. By presenting our bodies. Why our bodies, guys? Because our bodies are that mortal, fleshly thing that are sick. And if we present them willingly to God, he'll work in it. And he says, that's the best worship you could ever give me. Isn't that beautiful? Let's make him happy. It's going to rub off on us. We'll be happy too. John 15, 15, he says, I call you friends for all the things I've heard from my father I have made known to you. This is spiritual friendship. So what does spiritual friendship entail? He says, full disclosure. He says, listen, I'm not going to hide anything from you anymore. I'm going to tell you exactly what my father tells me, and I'm just going to release it to you because you're my friends. Okay, now how does friendship work? Friendship is reciprocal, right? If you want a real friend, you got to be the same way with them. So if we're going to be full disclosure people, what is it that we might hide? What is it that is precious to him that he would love to know about us? Our needs. The things we can hardly carry. The traits that we're ashamed of. We're tempted to hide those, right? But he says, come on. Let's be friends. Let's have total disclosure. I'll share what I could hide and would you share what you could hide? And we'll be friends. Number four, we know that it says, by the Spirit, we put to death the deeds of the body. So we know this thing can't be done just by trying. Oh, I'll try better next time. I'll try to be uh, more kind. I'm sorry about that word that I said. No. You need to go at that and kill that thing. And the way the Spirit does that is you confess and he forgives. And then there needs to be a transaction where you say, God, this isn't working for me. I got a dead thing that I'm trying to use all the time and prop up. This dead thing is hurting other people. It's my dead nature. And so, Lord, would you bring the spirit of life? What does it say? If the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, he will give life to your dead body. Your sin body. If you get that in your head and you call on it, you say, I would like some of that Jesus character, okay? I want that life, that resurrection life to replace that dead man right there. That's yours. That's yours. Jesus even said it to the Laodiceans. He said, why don't you come and buy from me? I have all the things you don't have. I have a covering for you. I have eye salve. I have things, everything you need, just come and buy. How do you buy? With your need, with your sin, just saying, Lord, change me. Yeah. 
So what's our choice? Our choice is to own and identify ourselves as sinners, just like Paul. We are positionally saints, but we are still sinners. Hey, that would be a great thing, not only for everyone who lives with you. Uh, stop trying to think that you're uh, better than you are. But uh, to anyone that you want to witness to, hey, it'd be really great to start out, hey, I'm in the same boat. I need a savior. Uh, people that you're afraid to talk to or even mention sin about because they might get offended. Hey, things might go differently if you approach them with more humility and actually said, hey, listen, I'm in the same boat and I've met a savior who loves every part of my sin and changes it and forgives it. And he is so in love with me. He is so overjoyed because he knows us so completely and is connected with us as only an infinite God could be who loves us. Hey, one of the things I realize is that uh, love of this type can't happen through us if we're still judgmental. And so the Lord, uh, actually I was praying for the church and the Lord, I actually started to laugh because uh, I saw like a farm um, uh, cart, big one, that you'd collect hay in or something like that. And it had a big uh, puller in the front that you'd attach to a tractor. And, uh, but it was filled with gigantic logs. And the logs were about nine to 10 feet long, a big wide things. And I looked at it and I said, Lord, is that for Cornerstone? Do you want to collect logs? And then I laughed. Take the log out of your own eye so that you'll be able to see. And here, the log of judgment, even towards Jesus, that you won't let him close because you think he's going to raise an eyebrow or be kind of ashamed that you thought something. No, no, he knows it all. He loves you still. Let's take that log out. Let's take the log as we uh, look at other people. How about ourselves? We don't treat ourselves well. That self-talk is like, oof. Judgment needs to be dealt with. And so I'm going to offer to you as we pray that you would give a log and give it to him, that you allow him to take it and put it in his cart. Because one of the things he showed me is he's collecting logs today. And he'll take it right from you. You'll be able to see, see him, see others, see yourself in a different way. The last thing I just want to encourage you is invite him in. I've been doing this ever since I've been studying this. It's helped me understand more of how much he loves me. And uh, I want to encourage you, open the door. Let Jesus into the hardest places, the, the most painful places, and ask that he is, his resurrection life would resurrect you in that place. And so just to tell you, my daughter finally did press the accelerator. And uh, the accelerator uh, uh, was able to take her up a hill and to go over bumps. And uh, she said, Dad, I don't like the accelerator. And, uh, but listen, in the spirit, here it is. If you don't access the power of Jesus, his resurrection power, you can't ascend and go anywhere. You're not going to be able to overcome any obstacle. You're just going to chug along like my daughter did when she didn't press the pedal. Or keep your foot on the brake, not trusting that anything wonderful could happen. But ask the Lord to release his power his resurrection power into your life experience. Lord, we thank you. Lord, I ask that you would take everyone's log that's willing to give it to you right now. Lord, we give our judgmentalness to you. Lord, collect them, pull them, out of our eye. Lord, that we might see and understand your love for us, your love for others around us, and your love for ourselves. Lord, free us 
from sin's effect and how it's imprisoned us in many ways. Lord, I pray, Lord, release your power right now. And Lord, we just invite you in. I pray that each heart would open the door to you to come in and change them, transform them, find a friend. Thank you, Pastor. Appreciate that. But we come to that moment uh, that we come to each and every week, having worshiped God and having listened to the word taught and preached. It's our time to respond to what God's doing in your life. And we're going to open up these altars here if you want to come and find a place to pray. If you're here uh, this morning and you recognize you have a log in your eye, you have a log in your life, and you want to lay that down. Again, these altars are open. You can come and pray and kneel here. There'll be people available to pray with you and for you if that's what you would like, but they're open. And you can turn your seat into an altar if you like. Spend some time just letting God do what he wants to do in your life this morning. It would be, it would be sad, maybe even tragic, to just hear and listen and even say amen and kind of respond without really responding and just saying, God, here I am. Open my heart to you, my life to you. Do in me whatever it is that you want to do. And maybe you're here this morning and uh, you're ready to take that step of faith in surrendering your life to Christ. Right? Jesus is able to save to the uttermost those who come to him. doesn't matter where you've been, how far you may have seemed to have fallen. Jesus can save you if you come to him. He'll turn your life around. He'll change you. That's what he wants to do. He'll make you right with God. He'll put you in a right relationship with God. It takes a step of faith to say, Lord, here I am. I'm coming. I'm a sinner. I know I've done things that are wrong. I've made a mess in my life, perhaps. Lord, I'm coming to you today for forgiveness. Come into my life. Forgive me. Take over. Show me how to live. I surrender to you. If you do that today, I promise you, you'll become brand new, a new creation. Old things will pass away. All things will become new. And we want to give you an opportunity to do that today. Whether you're here in this sanctuary or whether you're watching online, we want to invite you to pray and to surrender your life to Christ. So I'm going to pray and give you an opportunity to do that. And if you're here and you're ready to give your life to Christ, or you're here and you're saying, I'm going to, I'm just going to let the Lord do a work in my life. I'm going to pray with you and for you, and then these altars will be open. So let's pray. Father, thank you today for your amazing love. Thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for Jesus and all that he means for us, all that he's done for us. Lord, we could not save ourselves. And so you sent your son to save us. And we thank you for that. Lord, we all recognize logs and issues in our lives that, that Lord, we want you to deal with. And today we give you that moment right here, right now. We give you opportunity to do that work in our hearts. Come, Lord, change us and, and work in us by your spirit, Lord open up to you and whatever it is that you want to do. Lord, for those who are taking a step of faith and surrendering their life to you, saying, Lord, I need forgiveness. I need salvation. Lord, for those who are taking that step of faith today, as they come and they admit that they've, they've sinned, they've done things that they know are wrong, for which they need forgiveness. God, in this moment, as they acknowledge that, and in this moment, as they surrender to you and open their lives to you, Lord, come in with all of your forgiveness and grace and love, and may you just overwhelm them with your peace and joy and love as they surrender to you. May they experience today the freedom that comes from forgiveness, the freedom and joy that comes from knowing that they are loved by you and now in a right relationship with you as they acknowledge Jesus the Savior today. Touch them, we pray. 
In Jesus' mighty name, amen. And amen, amen. Again, these altars are going to be open as we close the service. You can come and pray. There will be people available to pray with you and for you. We want to receive an offering this morning. We want to take a moment to worship the Lord with our tithes and offerings missions, giving, and all those things that help take the gospel around the world. A number of ways that you can do that here at Cornerstone. Of course, you can text. You can use the, uh, the, the technology available to us, right? You can text your giving. You can use the Push Pay app. You can visit our website. There's a place for you to give there. Or you can use the offering envelopes that are found in your seats, and uh, you can put your giving in there. Just designate it and let us know where you would like that to go, who you are, and then you can place those in the offering boxes uh, as you're leaving. If you filled out a connection card this morning, that'd be a great time to drop that in the offering box uh, as well. And uh, just a reminder, today at 1 o'clock we have Growth Track. Love to have you uh, as a part of that. Today's step four. You can jump in and get started right with step four. It doesn't matter. Love to have you there if you've been a part of the church. But haven't been through Growth Track, we'd love to have you come and just begin that process and finding out how you can get involved, more about Cornerstone and its story and what God has been doing. So we'd love to have you uh, be a part of that. I want to pray one more time. Pray for the offering and then pray a blessing uh, as we prepare to uh, launch out into our work week this, this week. And so let's pray, shall we? Father, again, we thank you. Thank you for your blessing in our lives, Lord. You provide so abundantly. Thank you. It's our joy to give to you, Lord. We worship you with our giving. We bring it to you. Use it to advance the gospel, the good news of Jesus here and then around the world, Lord. Multiply it and use it to touch lives around the world, Lord. And as we head out into our week, Lord, to our workplaces, homes, and neighborhoods, Lord, we pray that you fill us with your spirit, that we might be salt and light to a dark and hurting world. Lord, to you belongs all glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you so much for being here. We look forward to seeing you again next Sunday. Have a great week.